welcome to all the things. We are here, finally, eventually. We had a little <laughs> technical difficulties. We apologize for our tardiness. Um, I am Monique Dusan. I'm Krista Bontrager, and also known as Theology Mom. Everywhere. Everywhere. And this is All the Things, the show where we talk about all things related to God, life, and the Bible. How have you been? Well, you know, it's it's been okay. Uh, I think I'm excited for this week. It's the big week. It's the annual meeting of uh, the Evangelical Theological Society nerds mm-hmm. and uh, getting together with, um, I don't know, somewhere between one to 2,000 theology nerds down in San Diego this week. So I okay. leave on Tuesday for that. Awesome. So, and you're going to kind of come along with me for part of the part of the fun. Yeah, I'm going to go to Biola on the road. Yes, right. Yeah. So we've got that. And um, just looking forward to seeing what kind of shenanigans are happening at ETS. So people can watch for some pop-up videos that I'll be doing throughout the week and the weekend and uh, just sharing some of my thoughts from ETS. Awesome. Awesome. And I've been okay too, people. (laughs) I'm just, you know, I'm just going to put that out there. I've been okay too. (laughs) I'm looking forward to the week too. Um, what happened this week? I feel like this week just kind of flew by. I know. Yeah. It did. Yeah. So a lot hmm. of good a lot of good reactions to our conversation last week about the Harriet movie. Yes. In fact, our friend Rachel went for her birthday. She oh. she was so inspired by our review that uh she and her husband went to go see it. So there it she- is. <laughs> oh, that's a good picture. I like that sweater. That's good. Yeah. That's a good one. So, so I got a few. I got a few responses this week. People went to go see Harriet, and they they really enjoyed it. It was it was good. So that's awesome. I'm glad because I really liked it. Yeah, yeah. Um, this week there, yet yeah, yesterday, no Thursday, I believe it was was the shooting at Saugus High. Yeah. Out so here, yeah. So hopefully, um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But you have some thoughts about that? I do. It's just it's a really really sad situation. Um, and our family sponsor, our show sponsor, not our family sponsor, our show sponsor, um, family 210. There it is. Woo. Yes. If you would like to help sponsor our show, keep the lights on and keep, um, the graphics coming, buy a (laughs) t-shirt. It would so bless and help us out. Yes. Very much so. Do we have a shirt of the week? We do. This is the Joy shirt. Uh, it's very popular uh, right now, and everybody likes it because it's uh, very joyful. Yes. <laughs> the joy of the Lord is your strength. There it is. Yeah. I was thinking joy to the world. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a good Christmas theme. Yes. Joy to the world. Yes. Yeah, many different uh, products. That's a sweatshirt and hoodies, and you can have a uh, a uh, coffee mug. Oh, I even see a pillow. A pillow. Oh, I like the pillow idea. You get a, a phone case. Oh, wow. Yeah. Tank top. Right on. There it is. So there it is. People can help support the show and get something fun. It's a great time to do something even for the holidays. It makes great gift. Yes. So, and it's a, if you're enjoying the show, uh, you know, this is just a really a, a way of helping to give back and, and to bless us as we have blessed you. Um, doing the show is not free. Uh, there is expenses involved in doing the show every week. And so this helps us to help to offset some of those expenses. So, yes. That. All right. You ready to talk about today's show? I am. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Run us down. <laughs> I'm doing the show rundown today. I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. All you right. <laughs> well, I'm excited because in a few <laughs> minutes we're going to have the big guest. Uh, Natasha Crane, uh, and I have been following her work for many, many years, and she's an author, a blogger, and I love the space that she's in and trying to equip Christian parents to incorporate apologetics into their parenting in their everyday life, because this is not the same world that we grew up with, and the culture is not going to support our value system, Mm -hmm. and so... We have to be quite intentional about how we're doing our parenting. So yeah. Natasha is going to be here to 
talk about all of that in just a couple minutes. Yeah, you can't just rely on children's church. Yeah, well, we have some no. discussions about Sunday school and children's church yes. as well. Yes, there's a lot more that needs to be done to keep your kids um, in a worldview that is counter the culture. Yeah. Yeah. So, and for us to be countercultural. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and then as you said, we're going to, you're going to share a few thoughts about the shooting this week. And yes, I have a little bit of questions and just some of my thoughts. And uh, yeah, all yeah. of the shootings. It's, it's really quite sad. Uh, there was it another is. one, I think yesterday uh, or the, or today oh. in, in New Jersey, I think. So, oh, that's yeah. Unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. No. So, and then I wanted to do a little thing. I found myself in a couple of conversations this week uh, where I heard Christians saying, you know, a particular issue was an agree to disagree issue. And I wanted to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we know what the agree to disagree issues are and what are the things that Christians need to be unified about? And how do we decide? How do we go about arbitrating that? Like you're talking about scripturally. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, we had a show a while back about women in ministry. Mm -hmm. Like, why is that an agree to disagree issue versus when we get to something like gay marriage that we're saying, oh, no, the line is in the sand. We're not. Hmm. This is not an agree to disagree issue. This is an issue of the core of our faith. Like, how do you arbitrate that? How do you know what on what side of the line you fall? Like, is that a majority rule thing? Like, how do you go about that conversation? Maybe so, when you get tired of arguing, it's just yeah. agree to disagree. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. So how do we how do we differentiate that? I have a few thoughts about that. Okay. Kind of uh, wanted to share some things, and then we have the tweet of the week. Yes, and we're going to. Uh, I'm going to surprise you. With there the it is. Tweet of the week. The tweet of the week and a surprise all in one. All in the same show because I know you love surprises. Yes. There is nothing greater that blesses my soul more than a surprise. <laughs> and we do want to encourage everyone to join us on the chat box. We know we we're a little late getting on the air, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. So let us know that you're watching. Let us know uh, where you're watching. And... Uh, what your questions are, especially if you have questions for us or the guest. Yeah. Um, we'll try. We always try to keep checking that chat box yes. in real time and making the show interactive and fun for everyone. So go ahead and join us uh, on the l- live chat. Okay. All right. Are we ready? It's about that time. It is about that time. All right. Let's get Natasha Crane up on Zoom. I'll fire up the Zoom machine. And this segment is not sponsored by Zoom, however. Uh, <laughs> welcome, Natasha. Hey. Hello, hello. <laughs> we are so excited to have you here. And we've been waiting for this because you had a big book deadline. And we were kind of waiting for that to pass. And now the book is at the publisher. So I guess that's a good way to introduce you. Why don't you talk to us about your ministry and how you got involved in this. Yeah, well, I, like you talked a little bit about earlier, I write and speak specifically about apologetics for parents. So it's a little bit of a niche area, uh, you might say, but I've been doing this since 2011. And I was actually just thinking about before the show that it was eight years ago this week uh, on Monday that I started my first blog. And uh, so that's kind of how I got started in all of this. I had three kids who were three and under at the time. And I decided that I was going to start a parenting blog because it was really hard to get out of the house with kids that age and hard to connect with people at church. There was just so much going on to keep my little kids alive. And so I thought if I started a blog, it would be a good way to meet people and uh, just exchange ideas with other Christian parents about how we're raising our kids to know and love the Lord. So I started my blog. It was November 17th in 2011. And uh, just writing about simple things like devotionals and songs, things that we're doing with our little kids. And after a while, as my blog was growing, I started getting these comments from skeptics, atheists and agnostics, skeptics of Christianity. And they wanted to comment on just about everything that I was writing, even though I wasn't writing anything very provocative and wanting to engage in any kind of debates. But they were coming along and challenging me on things that I really hadn't heard 
heard before, even though I was a lifelong Christian. So they were saying things like the Bible's filled with errors and contradictions. There's no evidence for God's existence. Science and faith are opposed to one another. There's no evidence Jesus ever existed. Just all these things that were basically blowing my mind as a Christian mom. And I realized, like you said earlier in the introduction, that my kids were growing up in a completely different world than the one in which I grew up. And so it basically lit a fire for me. And I realized that I needed to really be able to answer these questions because I was going to have to be able to answer them for my kids eventually. So I discovered apologetics, how we make a case for and defend the truth of Christianity, and just started reading everything that I could get my hands on. And as I was learning the answers to all these different questions and the challenges that skeptics were posing, I turned around and I would write about it on my blog. And I would say, hey, this is what kids are going to encounter. Here's what you need to know. And here's how we can talk about it with our kids. And that's really what I still do today. After all these years, I've been writing about these things. And that led to me having some opportunities to write books as well. So, so I've written two that are already out. And one, like you said, that I just finished writing and it will come out in March. Yeah, we have a graphic here of a, of a couple of your books. Uh, the first two that you you have out. And I want to make sure to flash that up there a few times during the show so people can get connected with you. Uh, your first book was called Keeping Your Kids on God's Side. And I love, love, love this book because it's sort of conversation starters and guidance and how to have critical conversations about questions kids are going to ask about their faith. And then you're talking with kids about God. Again, how to have critical conversations with your kids about God and different questions that are going to come up. Uh, are you allowed to give us a tease about what your next book is going to be? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the next one's called Talking With Your Kids About Jesus. So talking with your kids about God goes specifically into 30 conversations that kind of the God level, evidence for God's existence, science and God, the nature of God, those kinds of things. But the next book, Talking With the Kids About Jesus, is specific conversations about who Jesus was, his identity and his teachings and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So it's really a combination of theology and apologetics and correcting a lot of ideas that even Christians have today, a lot of progressive Christian ideas that have worked their way into the mainstream, especially with respect to the death of Jesus and the atonement and what the resurrection means and, and these kinds of things. So it's both apologetics in terms of why should we have good reason to believe these things happened, as well as theology, meaning how do we make accurate sense of what happened given what the Bible says. So I'm really excited about it. It's kind of the, the final part of this trilogy. So the very first book was kind of a apologetics 101 for Christian parents. And then the second book, it focuses really on the God conversations and this one on the Jesus conversations. Well, I can't recommend your books highly enough. In, in fact, I'm really hoping that every parent who's watching this show tonight or on the rebroadcast will invest in your books and start taking the time to have these critical conversations with their kids. I love recommending your stuff. And I think, I, I don't know if I've ever told you this before, Natasha, but you're doing the ministry that so many people wanted me to do. <laughs> and I just wasn't in a place in my life where I could do that because of so many of the struggles that I had when my kids were young with mental illness. But you are doing the ministry that so many people were like, I wish you would write a book like this. And I'm like, I just don't think that's what God's called me to. And so when you came along, I just love recommending your stuff to people because I saw the need. I just, I wasn't the gal for the job, but I am so glad that you stepped into that space. And I love recommending your resources to people oh, because thank you. they're just so, thank so, so, so important. So, and you're doing an amazing job now too with theology mom. So yeah. it's all about timing, right? It, it's yeah. All of a sudden it, it, things a very unexpected timing, unexpected ways. And now you're, you're doing a very important work as well. And so, yeah, it's, it's well, I'm glad that we've gotten to know each other a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, I had been praying for many years that there would be a way that I could meet you. So I'm super honored to, to have you on the show so we can introduce you to more people. Um, yeah, go ahead. How? OK, so I do not have kids, um, but I've done children's ministry forever. And I'm wondering how you see your books for parents being translated into children's ministry. You mean how they can use them in the context of children's ministry? Yes. Yeah. That or is, is this something like that is more meant for the at-home conversations? 
Well, primarily when I wrote the books and what I had in mind was that these would be resources for parents in the home so that a parent who's feeling like, oh my goodness, this world is getting crazy. I don't even know what to do. How can I still have influence with my kids when the world is pulling them away? I wanted to be able to give those parents resources that would be a solution for that so that they would feel empowered and have the confidence to speak into all of these challenges. So first and foremost, it's written directly to parents so that they can have the knowledge and then tailor that understanding to their kids' needs as they grow. So once, a lot of times parents ask me, so what age is this for your kids? It has nothing to do with the age of your kids. It's all about as parents having the understanding because then you'll find ways to teach your kids here and there uh, bits and pieces of what they need to know over time and you continue to build on that. But that said, in terms of a Sunday school kind of setting, there are a lot of ways that uh, the books can be used, especially for uh, educating teachers. And I think that this is one of the biggest challenges in getting apologetics to Sunday schools, that yes, we're lacking a lot in terms of curriculum, which I, I think we'll talk about a little bit tonight. But a lot of the problem is just between the curriculum and the students, you have teachers who may or may not be interested in the subject of apologetics and who may or may not have any understanding of it. And so I've known uh, several pastors actually who have given my books to their Sunday school teachers and said, hey, you know, take a look at these, learn about some of these topics and then find ways that you can incorporate some of these subjects into a Sunday school setting. So that's with the younger kids. But even with older kids with youth groups, you can take a, a question a week and say, hey, we're going to talk about this one tonight. Why does a, God, a good God allow evil and suffering? Uh, you know, does the Bible support slavery? All these kinds of questions. So there are a lot of ways that you can incorporate the topics into that kind of setting. But it is written first and foremost with the parent in mind. That's so good. And I'm glad you brought up the issue of Sunday school because we did want to kind of focus some of our conversation. Like there were so many things we could talk to you about. So I said, all right, if I only get her on once, like what are the things that we want to talk about? And so I thought uh, we, we kind of looked through your top 30 blog posts and kind of settled on a few uh, that were clustered around the theme of Sunday school and children's education. And uh I, I wanted to kind of probe that a little bit with you because for many Christian parents, Sunday school is the primary way that they are using, the primary tool they're using to educate their children about the faith. But I would like to kind of explore some of the concerns that you have and that Monique has experienced as well as a children's pastor, um, you know, to to think about like, all right, what are the, you know, what are some things here that maybe we need to understand about the dynamics of what's happening in a lot of Sunday schools? Right. Yeah, I, I think that it's, there's so many things, like you said, that we could talk about with respect to Sunday school and concerns. But if I had to just summarize it and kind of boil it down to one thing, what kids are learning in Sunday school is far too basic, given what they need in order to be equipped to deal with the challenges from a second world. So when I do talks, when I talk at conferences, or I go to churches and talk to parents, when I kind of try to give parents an understanding of what we're talking about when we say, let's teach our kids apologetics, I break it into four different areas. And I think that if we think about these four areas, it's helpful for understanding where a lot of Sunday schools are falling short. So the four areas that I tend to think of this in are number one, what Christianity teaches. Of course, we have to start there. Number two, why you should believe it. Number three, what others believe. And number four, how do we answer challenges? So this is my definition of apologetics, a little bit more broad than the traditional. It's about defending the faith. But I think these are really the components, the big components that go into that in a broader picture. So as far as Sunday school goes, I think that Sunday school misses completely for the most part, and there are exceptions to this. So I don't want to make any kind of blanket statements because of course there are churches out there where I'm sure that, you know, this is not the case, but by and large, in my experience and from what I hear from other parents, I, I don't feel uncomfortable making the statement that the vast majority of churches are not touching the final three parts of that four part framework. So they're very focused on what Christianity teaches, but they don't even go near why we should believe it, what others believe and how to answer challenges. So from that perspective alone, I think we can see that Sunday schools are really giving this very, very basic training. And not only that, but what they are teaching about what Christianity teaches 
tends to be quite shallow. Again, not a blanket statement, but in a lot of cases, it's a very shallow version of that. That's very focused on just continuing to rehash the same basic stories over and over without really connecting the dots and showing kids why this matters today. I was thinking of my own childhood. Uh, you know, I could tell you all these stories after growing up and spending hundreds of hours in church. I could tell you all about Daniel in the lion's den and Joseph in a multicolored coat and you know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I could tell you all these stories, but how they fit together and what that meant for me today, I couldn't have begun to explain to you. So I think that you know that at the broadest level is where I see the problem is today, that there's not the breadth of topics that we need for those four parts that I talked about. And then there's not the depth within the parts that are even are being talked about. Yes, you are preaching a good message <laughs> now. Yes. One of my big things with um, some children's ministry curriculum is that it wants to focus on the fun. Like, what are they doing that is fun for them? And I'm like, you know, fun is relative. What What is fun for me may not be fun for you. <laughs> but when we talk about our faith and what we believe and why we believe it and how we defend it and what we're standing on, it's so important. And it's important to be able to raise our children in that so that when they grow up, they already have that foundation. Fun isn't really a foundation. <laughs> so right. I really appreciate your stand and where you're coming from. Um, what do you think, or do not even what, but do you think that children's ministry not done well um, either hurts children or like puts them in more of a trajectory to walk away from their faith? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. And I think the statistics basically show that beyond just having an opinion about it. I think probably most people who will see this will have heard that there's this exodus from Christianity today of young adults who grow up in the church will walk away from their faith by their early 20s. So the researchers say that basically at least 60% of kids growing up in a Christian home will walk away by their early 20s. And I know that, you know, you hear research and statistics on stuff, and it kind of goes in one year and out the other. But this is not just a single study that was done at some point and becomes kind of this alarmist thing. This is something that has been replicated by all kinds of independent research companies over time. And they consistently find the same thing that at least 60% of kids are walking away. So this is not, there, there's no question as to whether there's a youth exodus. The only question is how how big is it in the estimates range anything from 60 to 90 percent so researchers also they don't just look and say okay this is a big bummer you know a lot of kids are walking away they actually dig deeper and they look into the reasons for that and when they look into these reasons they find over and over again that so many of them are intellectual in nature, that kids don't believe Christianity is true, basically. And there are all kinds of elements of that that you can break it down into, whether it's at the God level or the, the level of Christianity specifically, but they don't believe Christianity is true. So when you think back to that four part framework that I gave, you know, all the, the parts about, well, why should you believe it? And what do other people believe? And how do you answer challenges? All those things are critical if kids are going to understand why there's good reason to believe that Christianity is true. And Sunday schools, by and large, are completely missing out on that. So, yes, absolutely. Yes. I think that this has a large part of why kids walk away. And that's not to say that it's all incumbent upon the church because it is the primary responsibility of parents to disciple their kids. And I don't want anyone to take away something other than that from what I'm saying, but it's a desperate shame if the church isn't doing a better job on this themselves because not every parent is going to take upon themselves this duty. And if you think about all the kids going to church every week that have the opportunity to hear these things and to hear those good reasons we have for our faith and aren't getting that, that's really what I find to just be a, a devastating truth about what's going on today. You are on fire. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 and yes. Um, I love what you said about it's the parents' primary responsibility, but if parents are not taking up that role, or in my, in many cases, I had many children where the parents would drop them off for church, Sunday school, whatever, and then they would go back home. So it is our responsibility to make sure that we are raising and teaching kids appropriately and giving them a foundation that they can stand on. Yes. I think there's that for me, I, 
I really should just have the interview. Monique will just talk no, to I'm just Tasha. Saying, I just, I just want to give her a hand clap. If I can give fan you a little bit. Yes, girl. Yes. Yes. So, well, I, I think that for me, like one of the things that I really appreciated, you had a blog post about uh, how Sunday school is actually building the next generation of secular humanists. And I really would like to talk to that about that and have some very candid and real conversation because we've been kind of talking in broad generalities. But in, in my view, when I saw that blog post, I, I, I shared it within seconds after seeing it because I thought this is what I have been saying for years. And I would like to have us unpack some of your thoughts about that right now, because I don't think many Christian parents maybe have connected those dots. Yeah, so just in case people aren't familiar with that term, so secular humanism is just a belief that people can be good and should be good. They can be moral people without God. So it's a godless worldview, but with an emphasis on morality, basically. Um, and it's interesting that I, when I wrote that post, I, I really was thinking about the kinds of things that when my kids were coming home from Sunday school each week and I would talk to them about what they're learning and, and what I was hearing and from traveling to speak at other churches, what I would kind of find from talking to people about the Sunday schools there. What I kept hearing was that there's this real emphasis on character building, which of course is a good thing, but everything is kind of about being nice and, you know, we need to love others and we need to forgive others and we need to be good people. And how can you stop somebody who's being a bully? All these things are important. Don't get me wrong. But if that's the extent to which we are going in our Sunday schools, we are raising kids who eventually will say, well, I can do all of those things. I can be moral. I can, I can love other people. I can do good things. However, I'm going to choose to define that. I don't need to believe in God. And so that's why I said, I really think that a lot of Sunday schools are raising the next generation of secular humanists because there is not this really explicit intentional tie consistently coming back to Jesus and coming back to the gospel. And I do think that in the most part, for the most part in churches, you do hear about God, you do hear about Jesus. So it's not like they're not saying anything, but they're not connecting them. And this is where the problem lies. So kids basically hear, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, and Jesus forgives me of my sins. And then over here, I'm going to learn everything about how I need to be a good person. And so we are not getting deep on really, you know, who Jesus is and why that's so important, why that means that he has all authority for our lives, how can we be confident that's true and therefore he teaches all of this to us, we're not getting into all of that. So we kind of have these two parallel paths and kids don't know what to make of it. And when you don't have that piece we talked about earlier of why you should believe Christianity is true, it's really easy to grow up, say, I want to be a good person. I want to be nice, but eh, all that religious stuff, I, I'm just going to walk away from it. And so this to me is a huge concern and you end up raising nice kids who care about morality, but don't see how it relates to the Bible. And they actually did a study about this and I'm kind of blanking right now on the organization that did it, but it came out maybe a couple of years ago. And when they went and they interviewed kids who had walked away, the conclusion of this research was that they had heard plenty of things about Jesus. So they heard about God, they heard about Jesus, they heard the basic message of the gospel, but they never saw how it connected to all the other things that they were being taught. And this was an actual outcome of research studies. So I think the practical experience of seeing how often Sunday schools are not connecting the dots and seeing some of this research quantitatively saying, yeah, this is what we're hearing over and over in these kinds of percentages. I think it makes a strong case that the type of curriculum that we have in Sunday school is ultimately going to produce more and more secular humanists. Uh, man, that's a that's a powerful point. Mm -hmm. um, because I, what I'm seeing as well is that what happens is that kids who are growing up in Christian families, they they'll say like, "Oh yeah, I I regard the Bible. The Bible's important." But then, like, "Well, I'm a good person," and then they get more influenced on what good means. What does it mean to be a good person from the culture? And so then they, they end up falling into progressivism or even just deconverting all the way because their thoughts, their feelings, their opinions get elevated above scripture and what scripture says. So rather than teaching our children, well, we believe this because it's true and here's why it's true. And then 
because it's true, your life ought to conform to this. We don't conform scripture to our feelings or what feels like love or what our culture is telling us is okay as an alternative lifestyle. We conform to scripture because scripture is true. And that's a completely different paradigm. But when we're constantly just telling our kids, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, and we never get anything about holiness or truth or the the full enchilada of what Christianity is really all about, it's no wonder, I think, that so many kids are leaving the faith. Why do I need it? Why do I need Jesus to be a good person? I can be good according to my culture without Jesus at all. So I don't know. Monique wants to jump in here too. Now I'm not one to start trouble. I am sometimes, <laughs> but I feel like this could open up a whole can of worms and maybe I shouldn't mention it specifically by name, but orange curriculum to me is that exact thing that you were giving a warning about regarding secular humanism, regarding just wanting to build good character in people or in children. Um, you know, like, well, let's make sure that we are helpful. That's a good characteristic. Or let's make sure that we um, just whatever. We share. Yeah, we share. Like, whatever the character trait is. And then they'll bring Bible verses to be able to reinforce the character trait. And I just, I don't, I don't understand why the church, so many evangelical churches, have really like grabbed on to this curriculum that is really only promoting good moral habits. Like it's good for me to share. And, it's and good this, for me to be kind. Like that's great. And, and, and you have personal experience. With I do this. have, I, have I, I do have, we, we don't need to go into all the stories, but I do have <laughs> personal experience with this and, and standing out and speaking out against it. I just, I'm, I'm not really sure where the convenience, maybe that's what it is, like that, that we are now in an age where we want kids to have fun and we want things to be convenient. So let's give a watered down version to our children. I don't know. That's just kind of my thoughts. But I, I, I have, I, you know, I am definitely not an expert on all the different curricula that, that are out there, but I have personally seen orange in use. And I will say that I have the exact same conclusion. I'm right there with you. Um, and, and I had the same concerns that it was very much based on, you know, here are the character traits we want you to have in here as a Bible verse to support it. And so it's kind of like the Bible comes in to support what we all already supposedly know to be true. It's kind of this reverse situation compared to what Chris has said earlier, which I love how you phrase that. It's like, you know, because this is true, here's how we're going to live our lives. And here's how Jesus transforms us. This is completely different approach than what you see with orange. And in talking to some of the, the churches that, that use it and people who I know have been involved with you know, church, children's ministry in these areas, I think that a lot of the teachers like it because it's well put together. And so it makes it easy for the teachers. It kind of, it, it's easy to use. Uh, so I, from what I've heard from people feed, people's feedback, this tends to be the kind of reasons that I get. And I think that a lot of churches, if they don't pr- place intentionally a priority on children's ministry, it's the, it's just the easiest thing to plug into. It's like, Oh, okay. Tons of people use this. And so we're going to go ahead and just use it too. And it seems to be user friendly and great. So, you know, from that perspective, I think that that's why you end up seeing it in so many places. But I will say that no matter what curriculum a church has, it can be executed poorly or well. And you can have, and I have seen a church who uses orange that actually they go above and beyond in terms of how they implement it and how they train their teachers and the things that they do in the class. And it's actually a really good program. And in other churches, if you just plug and play with it, you're not going to get very deep. And by the same token, if you had the most amazing apologetics curriculum in the world, if the teachers don't get it, it's not easy to use. They don't understand it. Uh, they're not interested in apologetics. So they're like, why am I talking about this? I thought I was going to be talking about Joseph and, and Daniel and the lion's in. It's not going to go well. So there's got to be this meeting in the middle when we talk about curriculum of what teachers can use and how they're trained to use it. Because any curriculum can be used poorly or well. That's really good. Good thoughts. Yeah, and it's true that any curriculum can be used well or not so well. Yeah. 
And yeah, okay. We we, we got a few questions that's coming in. Say too. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> on the on the chat. So I wanted to pick a few of these up with you, Natasha. Um, one is uh, uh, one of our frequent viewers, uh, Rhyme His Songs, is wondering about the question of uh, maybe God isn't real because he doesn't answer prayers. I know that that's something you've addressed in some past blog posts. And um, I, I think that that is a question that is coming up more and more. Is, is that your experience? Uh, that I hear it more and more? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't hear that in particular. I hear from my own kids questions about prayer. I don't necessarily hear it so much in general, but okay. I think that this is a, when it does come up, I think this is a great opportunity to share with our kids why apologetics is so important because our feelings, we can feel closer to God. We can feel further away from God. These things can change over time. And if we acknowledge what the Bible tells us about God's character and who he is, we have to understand that if our prayers are not in the best interest of God's plan and God's will for us in the future and everything in the scope of the world that we cannot begin to imagine, then God is not going to answer our prayers in the way that we're hoping. And so that becomes a matter of trust and saying, okay, this is my prayer. This is what I desire. This is what I want so much. And I'm coming to you, God, because you tell me to come to you with all of my concerns and all my desires. But I also know that you will do things within your will. And so I think that's when we have to look at it and say, okay, to our kids, especially who ask this, we cannot decide whether or not God exists based on whether or not we see a specific answer to prayer. Because if we think logically and rationally about it, if a good and loving God exists, he's never going to answer our prayer in a way that is going to be harmful to us. And so just because we don't see the outcome that we want, doesn't mean he's not there. To know he's there, we have to go back to the questions of, okay, what evidence is there for his existence? And that's, I think, a really helpful way to help kids think about it. Because even a kid can understand, you know, what if I asked for God to strike down this person at school because I can't stand that person, right? Do you think God's going to answer that prayer? Of course not, because that's an evil thing and it goes against his character. We can't decide that, that, that God doesn't exist because that person did not get struck down. So I think putting those pieces together really helps kids to see, yeah, of course he wouldn't. So we can't decide that he's there or isn't there based on prayer. We have to understand, okay. Okay, here's the evidence for his existence. That's very good. That's a great answer. Um, one of our viewers is wanting to know about the age range. Like, yeah. what, what is a good age to start having these conversations with kids? Um, should we wait until they're in high school where they can understand more abstract concepts? What are your thoughts about age range issues? From the day you start talking with your kids about Jesus, you should be equipping them with a deeper worldview. So, you know, it's not a matter of treating apologetics as a subject that's separate from Christianity, like a, you know, an extracurricular kind of thing where when they turn 12, they're now old enough to understand why they should actually believe all of this. It's something that we should see as just part of their overall biblical worldview training. And that's why I always focus, and, and everyone always asks this question, uh, by the way, of how old your kids should be when you start. And so I always point parents back to the fact that if you personally get equipped with the understanding you need of apologetics, and that's why I write books specifically for parents, if you get equipped with that understanding, you will suddenly see the opportunities to talk with your kids about these subjects all the time. And I promise you that if you if you read these books, other books, whatever it is, I promise you, you will constantly have this world view radar up where, where you will see people make comments on social media, that can be a discussion point where you will hear things in the news where you'll see little opportunities in, in the grocery store where you see a magazine cover that says something, it comes up constantly, there's no lack of opportunity. So even from the time your kids are little, you should have in mind the topics that are challenges today and your understanding of them so that you can then tailor them to your kid's age. And it can be, I'll give you a really simple example. Uh, you know, even when my kids were very little, you could look outside at plants and we were having a caterpillar problem in our plants and you could see these holes that were very consistent with something that had eaten them and you could see the caterpillar poop even. And we can talk about, hey, you don't see the caterpillar here, but you see the evidence that the caterpillar is here. And we can talk about the difference between, you know, does this look like something that just happened to be here, this hole and these little poop things? Or is it something that you can tell was actually put here by a creature? And those are just simple ways that you can 
introduce the concept of evidence and what it means to to make uh, informed conclusions about things to kids who are even young. So once you get equipped as the parent, you'll be able to see these opportunities all the time. I don't think Monique was very fond of your caterpillar poop example. But <laughs> they yes. caught it on camera. That's so wrong. Yes, <laughs> talk I talk about poop. I know. I get it. <laughs> so, there it is. There but is. I want to augment something that Natasha is saying here because it is so important, and I want to make sure it doesn't pass people by. Because I get letters, and I'm sure she gets these letters too. And our friend Hillary gets these. Uh, Ferrer gets these letters too, from parents, and they want to know. What's the book that they can give their high schooler who's walked away from their faith? And in the back of my mind, I always think the time to have these conversations was like 10 years ago, you know, and if, if you've waited this long to have this, these discussions with your kids or the latest groundwork, it's, it's going to be a lot harder, possibly impossible to, to do that. And, the, the, the most important thing I always try to tell young moms uh, of young kids is now is the time to equip yourself with apologetics. Do not wait until their, cri their faith is in crisis or they come home and ask you a question. If, if God made everything, who made God? Or yeah. why doesn't God answer my prayers? The, the, mo the best, most optimal moment for moms to get ready for those questions is, is even before they have kids or when their kids are really young. And I know it's overwhelming. And I know that you're like exhausted from 2 a.m. feedings. And I know the reality of that. But trust me, these things take time. And, and you have to begin the process as a parent. You have to equip yourself first mm -hmm. and then incorporating it into everyday life everyday conversations. I'd be driving in the minivan with my daughter, Emily, and my daughter, Emily, who is now a junior at Biola, would ask me questions like, did Neanderthals brush their teeth? <laughs> did the first humans, she heard on a National Geographic special that the first humans, the most ancient language was the clicking language in Africa. So she immediately draws the, the connection. Oh, did Adam and Eve speak in the clicking language? These were the questions coming from the child when she was like <laughs> three and four years old, driving down the street. Mom, is asphalt a bio deposit? <laughs> oh, let me get back to you about that. So you never know when that kid is going to show up in your family and when God is going to bless you with that kid. And you need to, to start thinking about these things. And it, it starts early, the earlier, the better. I think that's a huge point in making sure that parents are equipped even before they become parents. But I do think that this goes back to something that we talked about with um, Mike, Mike, Dr. Mike Gurney, <laughs> that pe pastors aren't going to seminary. And so you're getting watered down messages in the pulpit. And then we're expecting parents to be theologians or versed in the Bible and then that they would pass this down or even see the need and the importance to, to have an apologetic type discussion with their child. Yeah. And so I don't know. I, I think that hopefully things like Natasha's ministry and this show and um, Hillary's ministry, you know, women in apologetics, their moms. Um, and not to say that fathers shouldn't be having these talks too, but we have to get the word out more because I don't know that parents are really getting the word in church that this is really important to keep your kid from walking away from the faith. Yeah. And I think that Natasha, I'd love it. I hadn't planned this, but I'd love it if you would talk about your gap ministry, because that is such a, a great fit for this. What we're talking about right now is support for parents who are wanting to get equipped in apologetics so that they can talk to their kids. 
Yeah, so uh, about a min- about a year ago, uh, a team and I we just started this, decided to start this ministry. See, I have a wall that goes up on Saturday nights, so I, I can't talk straight. Uh, it, but we started this ministry called Grassroots Apologetics for Parents. And if you go to a, that website, grassrootsapologeticsforparents.com, you can read more about it there. But basically, the idea is to have a chapter model where the local church starts these chapters, kind of like you'd have a MOPS chapter at a given church, for example, and uh, it would be led by what we call a parent ambassador. And a parent ambassador is basically just somebody who in the local church who has an understanding of how important apologetics is and wants to help other parents to get equipped with this understanding. That person has to be enthusiastic and willing to lead basically a weekly discussion group, but they don't have to be any kind of expert in apologetics. So we have people leading groups who are pretty new to apologetics themselves, but they're good discussion leaders. They facilitate these groups. And we lay out the whole thing to give you study guides and all that you need to do it. And basically, every group starts with a 12 week or 10 week discussion group on my first book, keeping your kids on God's side, because it's written specifically for parents. It's an apologetics one-on-one. So we have a whole guy that walks uh, the leader through how to use that. And then from there, we have a whole map so that every season fall and spring and fall and spring, then there are different recommended resources for what parents can study together. And so our goal is that a group would study together through four different seasons of study. But we have had groups who just do one season, they feel like they've learned a ton and they move on and that's great. Other groups are now going on to other seasons and we're excited about that too. So we've had several dozen chapters already launched across the country, actually in other countries too. And uh, we're planning to build it up even more in 2020. So if anyone's interested potentially in becoming a parent ambassador, please go to the website, grassrootsapologeticsforparents.com and just fill out the little interest form there and we'll, we'll get back to you and, and talk to you more about it. Yeah, it's such a great ministry. And if there's any church, any pastor who comes across this broadcast who lives in the East San Gabriel Valley, I am available to start a Gap chapter. I really want to, but I need a church who will get behind it and has a vision and will sponsor it. I will teach it, but I need a pastor with a vision and support. So there's that, just throwing that out there. Um, Let's go back to some comments here. Uh, Our friend Rhyme, his song is also wondering, do you have, do you cover the topics of abortion and euthanasia in, in your books? Uh, I have not covered those in my books. Actually, my new book coming out in March touches on the topic of abortion because there's a chapter I have about what do, how would we know what Jesus would have taught about subjects he didn't address? So, you know, if Jesus didn't happen to say anything specifically about abortion, does that mean we're free to conclude anything we want about abortion? Well, obviously not, but a lot of people claim that kind of thing today. And so I do touch on it very briefly in that I don't tackle euthanasia, but I'll say that for the most part, what I try to do is stick to the underlying worldviews and the evidence for the Christian worldview, because a lot of times I think that when Christians get caught up specifically on the cultural issue and they go back and forth debating with other people, it becomes this impasse because you're debating with someone who perhaps is an atheist and has a completely different source of authority for their lives, which is themselves, versus a Christian whose authority is the Bible and in God. And so that's why it's especially important to me that all this ultimately comes back to worldview issues. Yeah. But there are some great books out there that tackle culture, like um, Brett Kunkel and John Stone Street's book, A Practical Guide to Culture, is an excellent book. On That on is an content. excellent book. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of wrap up here, I want to let Natasha go so her family can come home. Uh, <laughs> but uh, a couple more comments here. Let's see. Um, my friend Susanna from church, uh, she's watching us tonight, and she says, This mom, meaning herself, was too late with her 28-year-old son who now identifies as an atheist. And that is a very tough situation. And and the ministry that I work for, Reasons to Believe, often reaches those kind of people. That's that's our audience of who we're trying to bring the gospel to. Many atheists, skeptics, scientists, uh, many of which who grew up in the church and then left their faith and... um, So just different ministries, different seasons of life, different situations. But Susanna, I know that you have a heart for your son and uh, keep praying for him and uh, maybe direct him to the reasons.org website. Uh, My friend Laura, our friend Laura in um, Texas, she says she had one of those kids too. I think kind of like Emily. In fact, our Emily and Shelby were friends with each other and we're in an apologetics club that I ran for the high school youth at, at our church several years ago. 
asking uh, off the wall questions at a young age. The important thing is keeping them asking the questions well into adulthood and staying. Mm-hmm. And I know Laura does a great job of staying in the conversations with her kids. So once again, Natasha, I want to make sure that people know how to get in touch with you. They get your books. Maybe we can flash yes. her books up there one more time. Keeping your kids on God's side and talking with your kids about God. Forthcoming, talking to your kids about Jesus. Jesus. And um, maybe just once again, remind us of your website. Yeah, you can go to either christianmomthoughts.com or you can just go to my name, natashacrane.com. It all goes to the same place. And it's C-R-A-I-N. Awesome. Awesome. We are so glad that you... Uh, set aside the time for us, Natasha. This has been a, a great, a great discussion. Very informative. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been great talking to you ladies. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. All right. Wow. Yes. It's important to raise your kids well. And Natasha's husband is the, um, like the CEO or COO of um, the Orange County Rescue Mission. Mm-hmm. And you and I get to go down there. Oh, there she is. Oh, right there. oh okay. <laughs> We do right. not see we her. We do not see her. All right. Because we're on the two shot. Okay. But uh, we uh, get to go down there once a month and lead a theology and apologetics discussion for the residents at the rescue mission. And either Monique or Bob usually tag along with me. And I'm just super honored to be part of that because even people who have become homeless and are getting off addictions and a lot of hard situations in their life. God has given them a mind and they are created in the image of God. And I love Natasha's vision that she started that apologetics ministry at the mission uh, to be able to equip and train Mm -hmm. those Christians as well. And meaning not just their physical needs and their vocational needs, but their intellectual needs. Yes. And there's tons of good questions that come out of that group as I um, get to sit and listen. Like their, their questions are definitely Amazing. amazing. And yeah. Yeah. Just super honored to to know Natasha and her husband and grateful to be part of that that ministry. So uh all, all right. right. Well so now for something completely different. Yes. <laughs> the the how do we know if it's agreeable, disagreeable? Oh, yeah. All right. I don't know if we're gonna talk about the shootings next. Ah, uh, we can wrap that up. We'll wrap okay. it up on the end. All right. Um okay. agree. Do do I agree? Do I disagree? Do I just refuse to argue? Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of where I'm like, you know, it's agree, agree to disagree. I completely disagree, but I just will refuse to argue. It's just not always the best approach. But, okay, so here's what happened to me. Um, I was in a conversation on a call this week with a, a group of people, very, very bright women. And we were talking about various theological things. And the question came up of, well, how do we decide what the core of our faith is? Like, how do we know? You always hear this 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 uh, cliche. Um, well, it's okay if we disagree about that because it's not a salvation issue. And I had never heard that before. You told me. Oh, really? No. Oh, I hear that so much. It's just it's it's okay. It's just it's not a salvation issue. It doesn't matter. And I hear this a lot in conversations about the age of the earth. I have to step uh, my game up to be in more holy circles, I suppose. <laughs> we just, I don't know. I've never heard this. <laughs> uh, women in ministry, you know, should women be ordained or not? Well, it's okay. It's not a salvation issue. We can just dis- agree to disagree. Oh. Um, I had a conversation with a colleague this week at work, and uh, we were d- discussing, you know, whether or not hell, the doctrine of hell, was an agree to disagree issue, or is that like a, a more classical core christian doctrine what about the trinity what do do you have to believe in the trinity to be a christian and um i guess i just kind of had a am i the only one like go in the chat box people have you am i the only one who's ever heard this saying uh that there's a that's not a salvation issue this is used as a criteria for to decide whether or not it's okay to believe in something and I've even heard progressives say this, well, it's not a, gay marriage is not a salvation issue. So that can become in the category of an agree to disagree issue. And more conservative Christians will say, no, it's not an agree to disagree issue. That's a line in the sand. Like we can't cross over that line. 
And so this is kind of the what I'm hearing out there as I'm talking to people. And this, this saying keeps coming up. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. Like you've ne- like, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Well, I'm, is this I'm, not even a really a segment? I'm just, like, should I'm I just go to, get some mac no, and cheese or I'm something? Trying, but if you do, can you bring me some? <laughs> I was just trying to figure it out because I'm like, well, when do you decide not to let it run to the line of an argument? So can I just believe that this is true? Just arbitrarily? Well, no, like the doctrine of hell. Uh huh. Can I believe that hell is real? It's a real place and that one day people will go there and pain and suffering will exist there and it's eternal separation from God. And you not like I, I'm wondering if people are saying like it's we'll just have to ag- agree and disagree so that we can walk together. Or should we not walk together in fellowship because we don't agree on these things? I guess that's that was the question inside of my head. Like, okay. like, do we not, just because we don't agree on these things, can we not walk together in fellowship? Well, I think that sometimes it comes to that. Like, sometimes a church will have to decide, well, what are the things that we're going to have as agree to disagree issues? Because if you go on a... And we did a whole show about churches and we did a whole thing about looking at church doctrinal statements, but very seldom in a church doctrinal statement, are they going to tease out like, what's the official position of the church on the age of the earth? Mm -hmm. And is it, is it 6,000 years old or are we going to accept conventional scientific ages? Uh, Very seldom do you see right on the church website. Sometimes you do, but, but often not about their view on women in ministry. And you, you, sometimes you have to kind of implicitly just look at the staff page and see what women are on staff and in what positions they are. And then you kind of know. But but it's but would we allow a woman to do a guest pulpit on a Sunday morning or do we allow women to be elders or, you know, like what's the agree to disagree issue? Or could we have a a, a board of male elders where some of the male elders think the earth is young and some think the earth is old. Like, would that be an acceptable way of coloring in the lines or out, or is that outside the lines? And what I often hear is, well, it's just not a salvation issue. Like this is the primary criteria that's put forward as how do we decide what an agree to disagree issue is and I, what I guess what I wanted to comment about it is that I don't think that's the right question. I don't think that that's actually very helpful to say what, to ask the question, well, is this an issue of salvation or not? Because Christianity is so much more than just getting saved. Christianity is a worldview. It's a network of beliefs. It's, it's a, it's, it's not, it, it's almost like evangelicals today want to take what I call like the minimal facts approach to Christianity. Like, well, what's the minimal thing that we need to, to believe or to think in order to be a Christian? And then we could just disagree on the rest. Well, that to me doesn't provide a helpful uh, rubric for being unified um, because Christianity is so much more than that. It's more than just getting saved. It's more than just getting somebody converted and and baptized. Mm -hmm. Like in the more ancient faith traditions, conversion takes, it takes time. Sometimes you have to go through conversion classes for a year or more Um, because historically the idea has been, we really want you to know what it means to be a Christian, that being a Christian involves believing in the Trinity, in the incarnation, um, in salvation, in holiness, walking this way, living this way. The Christianity isn't just simply, I asked Jesus in my heart and now I go to heaven. That's kind of this minimalistic approach to the faith. When you become a Christian, Christianity permeates your whole life and it affects your decisions, it affects how you use money, it affects how you engage in friendships. It, it, it affects how you engage in family. It, it affects so many more things than just getting saved, getting into yeah. heaven. And so 
when I hear people um, talk about this, for me, what I'm seeing in a trend in a lot of churches is there's not a lot of what we used to call discipleship happening. And that's a lot mm -hmm. of what Natasha is talking about earlier in the show is this concept of teaching people what we believe and how to live as a Christian. It's not this minimal facts approach of, well, it's okay. We could just agree to disagree. It's not a salvation issue. So therefore we don't need to talk about it. No, there's, there's a lot more to being a Christian than just getting saved and getting into heaven. So I think that we have kind of this, this poverty in our soul because we're, we're so busy just trying to get people baptized and converted. We're not really teaching them what the church used to call catechizing them on what it really means to be a Christian. And, you know, if you don't have the Trinity, you don't have Christianity. Yeah. If you don't have the incarnation, you don't have Christianity. The doctrine of, of hell and being separated from your creator for all of eternity has been part of the church from the beginning. You, we can't just wake up one day as Protestants and decide, you know what? I think that's an agree to disagree issue. Like, we're not in charge of that. That's not how that works. So, I don't know. You're this is, I feel like nobody's catching the vision here of what I'm trying to do. That's okay. Monique's like, why are we talking about this? Why is this a segment? No, I, I get it. I, I get that that the foundation of Christianity are things that are not agree to disagree. Like these were the things taught by the ancient church and should be held. I just wonder at what point do you break fellowship with someone or at what point do you not engage in relationship with a non-believer or, you know what I mean? Like I get that I can be firm in, in all of these things and I may have a friend. Actually, I do have a friend. Who doesn't okay, Natasha's glad we're talking about it. She okay. sent a comment. I, I do have a friend who, who doesn't believe in hell. Okay. Do I break fellowship with her because she doesn't believe in hell? I see. I see the question. I guess for me, what I would try to do with that person is make the case, mm -hmm. you know, of that, you know, being a situation like that would cause me to go back to scripture and really try to inform myself. And then going back to that person, since we're in a friendship relationship, to start asking questions. Well, what do you do about this verse? Yes. How do you handle this? Yes. And then, and then beginning those conversations and engaging in a, 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 a more rigorous defense rather than just saying, well, we don't have to talk about it. It's, we'll just make it an agree to disagree. Well, we, we've had quite a few conversations on it. And that's why I'm I'm wondering, well, at what point do I say, well, you know, friend, sorry. I don't I don't know if it's worth like breaking fellowship with somebody. I mean, my brother is LDS. We have all manner of differences about doctrine. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I don't I want to stay in relationship with my brother. I love him. And both of us are in this awkward space of trying to convert one another to our respective positions, but we've learned how to navigate that and stay in relationship with each other. I deeply love my brother. Like after my husband, like the man that's closest to my heart is my brother. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to cry just thinking about it. Like he's so close in my heart, but you know, we have deep and, and profound differences about our, about our faith. And, but we talk about them. And so I wouldn't break fellowship with somebody over a, a doctrinal difference, but I would certainly engage in a rigorous conversation to try to, to put forward the, the, the historic Christian position and to point out that their position is the unique and novel and Johnny-come-lately position. Mm -hmm. I am defending what Christians have, have always believed. believed. Yeah. And so I would, I don't know if I would break fellowship though over that. Now, if I'm in a church leadership position, I probably wouldn't put somebody in leadership who was a universalist and, and didn't believe in hell, but that's a different issue. You know, I think that we can have a personal relationship 
with one another, but that's a different conversation than, than being in church leadership. Well, I think that's a good distinction too, because where we are agreeing to disagree and how we're agreeing to disagree or disagreeing or agreeing um, is important. I think that all of that context is extremely um, important in looking at the relational aspects and looking at leading and yeah, like the life of, of a church. So my friend Susanna, I love it that Susanna is uh, chiming in tonight. Uh, she says, when dealing with interfaith or ecumenical events, there are things that we can band together to prevent evil in our world. If we are talking about salvation in the Christian worldview, it's totally different. Yes, so Susanna, you are such a good student. Susanna was in my adult Sunday school class for a couple of years, and I love it that she's saying this because... I, it is, it's important, another distinction to make is like, what are the places where we can agree with one another, even across worldviews? Like, um, I'm not Catholic. I'm deeply sympathetic to Catholics. Um, but I can lock arms with a Catholic or a Mormon who is pro-life. And that's an issue that we can, we can help advocate for in our culture of the sanctity of life. And, and there's even um, atheists who are pro-life. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, I can find commonalities with all of those people because that particular value um, goes across our worldviews. So I don't have a problem with that. But when I'm talking about the distinctiveness of the Christian worldview, I'm going to make my case as to why I think that is true. But I think that often what I hear in the church is this, this trope of, well, it's not a salvation issue, so we don't need to talk about it, or we don't need to, we don't need to, to really get into it. And when we, in and reality, we really do. We do. We do. Yeah. Like, the Trinity is not an agree to disagree issue. If somebody's running around with a faulty view of the Trinity, we need to have some conversations. Uh, we, need to, we need to talk about that. If someone's denying the doctrine of hell— we need to have a conversation about that. That's not an agree to disagree issue. Now, our friend Annette was saying, what about things like eschatology? And I'm so glad you brought that up. Like, and eschatology is doctrine of last things. Um, so it's about the coming of Jesus and that sort of thing. Now, this gets into um, sort of the criteria for deciding what's most important, you know, that, well, it's not a salvation issue. Okay. This is where this, that to me, that is profoundly not helpful, that criteria, because I have Christians all the time try to tell me the things like the rapture, the mark of the beast, the seven years tribulation are all essentials of the faith. Like if I don't believe those, I'm some kind of second class Christian, a Bible compromiser. It's like, yeah, but no Christian believed in those things until 150 years ago. Do you really want to say that all the Christians who came before 1830 were, were like out of the faith? Like that, that doesn't make any sense. And so when we talk about something like last things, what I find so helpful is just to ask a different question. Not is this a salvation issue, but ask the question, what have Christians historically believed about this? What is in the creeds? What do we find in the first 300 years of the church that the church believed about this issue? So to apply that to last things, well, they believed in the second coming. They believed in a future judgment, a separation of those who are in Christ and in Adam, and an eternal state of heaven and hell hell being separation from God, heaven being intimate relationship with God. These were the kind of the, the big ideas that the church historically believed. So asking the question, what did the church historically believe in the first 300 years, especially putting a spotlight on that, that to me provides a helpful lens to identify what the key issues are. So when I look at something like the mark of the beast, the seven-year tribulation, the rapture, 
if these ideas don't show up until 150 years ago, I'm not going to go around calling them core hmm. beliefs. They're, they're distinctly American ideas that arise in American theology in the mid-1800s. That's where those beliefs come from, to be differentiated from the second coming, the judgment, and the eternal state. Those are the great beliefs of the historic Christian church. So it's a little more complicated than just asking the question, is this a salvation issue? To me, a better question to ask is, what has the church historically believed about this issue? So that gets us to the issue of hell. Yeah. Um, that has been a historic Christian belief from the beginning. So I don't know. Those are, those are my thoughts about that. Um, Good stuff. All right. I'm just checking the comments here. See if anyone. Uh... There are some. Yeah. Rhyme his song says, so Krista's point might be, uh, yeah, Christianity is all the things, not, not just, just bare bones. Yes. Yes. That's very clever. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's it's good. So those are my thoughts about kind of the, the minimalist approach to, to our faith. It Christianity is a worldview. Mm-hmm. It's not just about getting us to heaven. It's so much more than that. And we have to train people. We have to um, ask them. We have to really be deliberate uh, about how we're training people and, and how to talk about their faith and know what they believe. So, yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah. All right. Not just dunking people. All right. No, don't just dunk people. <laughs> <laughs> Adding to our numbers. Let's get some butts in the seats. Yeah. All right. Um. All right. Do you want to do the thing about the shooting? You know, I'm wondering about time. Okay. Um, yeah, it is late. Yes, it we, is. We started a little late. We did. We started 15 minutes late. All right. Should we go to the tweet? Yeah, go ahead. All right. So here is the tweet of the week. Oh, we're back to the Kramer one. This is the most special of them all. Almost Thanksgiving. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So we did the show a few weeks ago about Kanye, Mm -hmm. and this is kind of a follow-up to that. I saw one of the comments I had made to you recently was, hey, maybe Kanye is the new Johnny Cash. Yeah, and I said, nope. Oh. (laughs) I still say that. Nope. But, you know, Johnny Cash had this this dramatic conversion in the late 60s. Uh, He had grown up in the church, but he had fallen far away from his faith Mm -hmm. and had really had some massive... Uh, and formidable problems with drugs. Um, But in the late 60s, he kind of um, went back to the faith of his youth and became very dedicated and started traveling with Billy Graham and doing crusades. Mm. And he was doing, and he started doing prison concerts. His prison albums were 1968, 1969, Folsom Prison, San Quentin. And he was known for doing uh, many concerts throughout the years in prisons, in prisons. And he would always do a mixture of kind of his radio hits and gospel music and that sort of thing. Well, then I'm on Twitter last night and I see this. Kanye West surprised Harris County inmates with a jail performance today. Go ahead and roll the video, Bob. Like we're not playing. Um, so there he is coming in. Choir that he takes with him everywhere. I don't know how he's like financing, financing these people, but I don't know why they don't have chairs. I don't know. I, 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 that's the I don't know. The Johnny Cash prison concerts they have. Oh. Yeah. So there he is. That's awesome. Some of his music, and he. He did a gospel presentation. Here he is. He's been uh, doing some of his songs. Can you keep the volume up? Here they're leading on a prayer. I accept Jesus. And then he did a concert for the women.
chairs either. I don't know. Why? Well, I hope it I love the gospel, though. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a so anyways, law enforcement officer. I started to go and serve my community here in my hometown. This is uh, but, but, uh, we need to be, this is the gospel be fire getting some crime. words, we want our community I think, before the concert does. from the but warden. we don't have to lose our humanity and our compassion. So. So God bless Kanye West. I'm just going to keep yes. riding the wave a little more. I know there's people that are skeptics and think he's just doing this for show, but... Uh, I'm not a skeptic. I just don't think he's Johnny Cash. All right. <laughs> well, nobody's Johnny Cash, let's be honest. Oh, there's that. But... No, yeah. I mean, know. and if, if he was a skeptic, um, if or you, if, if, if skeptic. he were, if he is, whatever, if he's pretending... Yeah, um, if it's just a show. Yeah, if it's just a show, I think that the transformation that's happening in other people's hearts is real. And so... You know, but I wouldn't, I'm not one to, to say that he's a a pretender. Yeah. I'm just going to ride the Kanye wave a little longer, but uh, I I appreciate what he's doing. I've, I've long prayed that some Christian artists would catch a vision like Johnny Cash had of going to prisons, going to Indian reservations, going to places where um, there were people there that also need the transforming message of the gospel. And I know that there are so many um, people that are not famous who who minister diligently and do the ministry grind in anonymity mm -hmm. in our jails and in our prison systems. And we need the Lord of the Harvest to send more workers there. But I love highlighting what Kanye is doing and raising the visibility about this. Um, I, I just think it's an important thing. So yeah. it's awesome work. <laughs> yeah. It's good. Okay. Well, no oh, no chairs in auditorium because overcrowded and people use chairs as weapons. See, I oh. um, kind of have shows in batches like moving inmates in and out quicker. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now we know. Yes. There is that. All right. All right. This has been fun. Yeah. I enjoyed the show. Uh, once again, we want to encourage you to check out the show notes. I'll be putting some links to Natasha's uh, blog posts that inspired our conversation there. And so just go to theologymom.com slash all the things. And once again, we are on Instagram mm -hmm. now. So if you're on the gram, go find us on Instagram at ATT Livestream. Uh, you can also email us at attlivestream at gmail.com. Yes, and if you're in Southern California and you have not already registered for the Women in Apologetics Conference, yes. it is coming in January. Get your tickets early. For the best price, there's only a couple more, more weeks left for the yes. best price. So, we yeah. will be speaking um, on critical race theory, and it's creep into evangelicalism. I think Natasha's and... going to be there as well. I so, believe so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, make sure to, to get your ticket. And if you're not in Southern California, just come on out or know? get the live stream. There's yeah. A, there's okay. A, yeah. For 20 bucks, you can get the live stream of all the plenary sessions and the worship. Okay. So, yeah. It's a great deal. Yes. And share the show, share the show, share the show, share the show, please. Uh, we need your help to help us get the word out uh, Natasha was so gracious in coming on, but this is like small potatoes for her. She's been on the focus on the family show. Mm -hmm. She's been on all the big things. So nice of her to come on our, our burgeoning effort here, but we need our viewers help. If the show blesses you share the show, share the show, share the show. We yes. need your help and right. continue to, um, help support the show also through our family's clothing store, uh, family 210. And, um, Find us on social media. So that's it. And with that, folks, we are out. Bye. See you next time.
Krishna, thank you.